Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Happy Sunday, everyone. Welcome to St. Hilary Church, where the air is fine and the sun is shining. We are so glad that you are here with us today. I want to ask you kind of a tough question to begin this Mass. I want you to think of a time when you have felt excluded. Maybe it was from a group or from an activity or from something you really wanted to be a part of. And try to remember what, those, what it felt like to be excluded. It's a tough feeling and I'm sorry to ask you to recall that today. I think there's been times when we have all felt that way. But I think if we can begin to remember those times when we've been felt like we've been excluded where those times where we have not belonged then we can understand more and more people in our world who have been marginalized people who have felt ostracized people who have been sidelined and we can empathize with them and enter into solidarity with them today we continue our message series called not in my backyard and we're going to be talking about positive ways that you and I can build communities of inclusion where everyone and their differences are not only uh, tolerated but actually appreciated, where everyone's talents have something to contribute and where everyone is welcome. As we begin this Mass this morning, let us take a moment to call to mind our sins Let us call to mind especially those times when we have been exclusive, when we have kept others at bay. And let us ask the Lord for mercy and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you healed the sick. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgave sinners. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you gave yourself to heal us and bring us strength. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God. And on earth, peace to people, to people of good.
Let us pray. O God, who manifest your almighty power, above all by pardoning and showing mercy, bestow, we pray, your grace abundantly upon us and make those hastening to attain your promises heirs to the treasures of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, you say the Lord's way is not fair. Hear now, house of Israel, is it my way that is unfair? Or rather, are not your ways unfair? When someone virtuous turns away from virtue to commit iniquity and dies, it is, because, is it because of the iniquity he committed that he must die? But if he turns from the wickedness he has committed and does what is right and just, he shall preserve his life, since he has turned away from all the sins that he has committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. The word of the Lord. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the waters to cease. Oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. You're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go but with the Lord of all? Oh, oh, oh. the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any solace in love, any participation in the Spirit, any compassion and mercy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing, do nothing out of selfishness or out of vainglory. Rather humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interests, 
but also for those of others. Have in you the same attitude that is also in Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, what is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. He said in reply, I will not, but afterwards changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, yes, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They answered, the first. Jesus said to them, amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're now in the third week of our six-week message series called Not in My Backyard. We're taking a hard look at societal divisions like race, class, and other differences that keep people apart. This series, we know, it's a little uncomfortable <laughs> because it, it has been challenging us to examine ourselves for unconscious bias when it comes to groups that have been traditionally marginalized. It's a call for us to consider the, the, the false narratives that we sometimes unintentionally construct about different groups like immigrants, the poor, the disabled, and people of color. But when we're able to see that we can do better and begin to move in the right direction, then real healing can begin. Now, in the first week of the series, we considered Radical, the radical evil of racism. You know, every time we think we put it behind us and reached some sort of racial promised land, incidents of police brutality, court decisions that seem unjust to some, and the ensuing demonstrations and counter demonstrations that frequently turn violent sadly remind us that we still have a lot of work to do. Last week, in the series, we looked at a different kind of societal different, uh, division. We talked about socioeconomic class and the problem of justice. We said that <clears throat> generosity and entering into solidarity with the poor is the best way to heal those divisions. And to do that, we, one way we can do that is to simplify our own lives so that we can begin to see more and more through the eyes of the poor. And we said we also need to do something, however small, to advance the cause of justice. Now, if you missed either of those two prior messages in this series, you can always find them on our website. Well, today we look at the root of all our problems with social conflict, which is 
I think, the human inclination to include some and exclude others. See, everyone has a need to belong, right? As God said in the Bible when he created the first woman, it is not good for the man to be alone. Whether it's being a member of a family or a profession or a school or a church, belonging to a community is at the core of our very humanity. When people feel they belong, life takes on new meaning. When they believe their contributions are valued, their self-worth is enhanced. Belonging to a meaningful group provides a sense of identity, a feeling of security, and a structure within which we can feel like we're making a difference. One study even found that a sense of belonging predicts longevity. Those with a significant network of support and close friends they can count on, meaningful relationships with people that love and accept them, families they live with, and an active social life tend to live longer than others. The problem is that creating a sense of belonging within a group often comes at the cost of excluding others. The more we make membership exclusive, the greater the value for those who belong. And so we end up segregating ourselves in neighborhoods, congregating behind gated communities, and hiding in the safety of our backyards. We hold tryouts for sports teams and auditions for key roles. We require exams to get into certain schools and professions. And a lot of that's necessary, of course. But social exclusion in any form is probably the most painful experience any one of us can endure. Scientists have studied what happens when people experience rejection. The part of the brain that allows us to feel physical pain is the same area that becomes active when we feel excluded. It's that painful. When we experience social exclusion, life becomes less meaningful. We become less productive and we literally can't think straight. In one study, for instance, participants scored significantly lower on IQ tests after suffering rejection. In fact, social exclusion scientists have found is more harmful to our overall health than obesity, physical inactivity, or even binge drinking. And when people are banished from the support and security of a group, they are far more likely to turn to unhealthy associations to fill the void. Well, I know this all too well personally. I, I have felt the pain of being excluded many times in my life. I could give you incident after incident, and let me tell you, it hurts. It goes back to grammar school, to the PE teacher who allowed the team captains to choose who would be on their teams. I was always the last boy chosen, and reluctantly. It goes back to the girl I liked in middle school who invited all the kids in the class to her party, except me. It goes back to high school and where I would sit at lunch, I once had a nightmare while I was on a Boy Scout camping trip. <laughs> it was early morning, and everyone was having breakfast and breaking camp, but I couldn't get the zipper on my tent to open. And I kept screaming for, for someone to come help me. I could see them outside the, 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 the screen. They were eating breakfast. They were having fun, and then they, they were packing up, and they started to march off into the wilderness. And I kept screaming and screaming, and no one heard me. And finally, I was left alone. The feeling I had in that dream still haunts me today. Even seemingly small events can trigger deep feelings of exclusion. Well, perhaps some of you have had these same kinds of experiences, and maybe even worse. And if you have, you know the pain of exclusion is almost unbearable. And for groups who have been historically ostracized, that pain can easily morph into anger and sometimes erupt into uncontrolled violence. That's how severe the emotional impact can be. If there's anything the events of this summer have taught us, it is that we can no longer live this way. 
We must begin to heal the divisions in our society by practicing radical inclusion. And that means starting to pay attention to those who have been disregarded, welcoming the historically marginalized, valuing people who have felt discounted for far too long, and consulting those whose wisdom and genius have been dismissed over the years. Inclusion is far more than simply the act of not excluding people. It also means respecting their differences and encouraging their active participation because you believe that their contributions are indeed valuable. It means creating environments everywhere, in the workplace, within family structures, in schools, in academia, in politics, in the public forum, and in personal relationships where everyone feels they are first among equals and where those in power truly believe that each individual has something important and interesting to contribute and is worth getting to know personally, investing in the development of their talents and supporting their growth. Radical inclusion is the fundamental principle of human evolution and has the power, if we could ever achieve it, it has the power to unleash the full potential of the many diverse peoples on this planet. It expands our limited understanding. It dampens conflict and it facilitates mutual understanding. But the most important reason to practice inclusivity is that God himself is inclusive. In fact, it defines the very being of God. From all eternity, God existed as a community of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equal persons, all inclusive. And then, one day, when God's spirit broke into the world and created everything that exists, he fashioned the incredible diversity of life forms that populate the earth, from tiny single-celled organisms to the various species of plants and animals, to the many languages, colors, and cultures of the human race. It is by God's design, and he said it is good. And when the injustice of man against man was sparked by the first act of taking another person's life, God intervened and began the slow and gradual process of restoring the image of an inclusive God that had been fractured within our own humanity. He gathered a heterogeneous group of slaves from many different religions and nationalities and races and adopted them as his own people. He led them out of slavery into safety to become a model of holiness for the whole world. And in the fullness of time, he sent his only son to gather all the scattered sheep and shepherd his one flock, leaving not even a single one behind. During his ministry, Jesus healed the sick who were deemed unclean and no one else wanted to touch. He freed the oppressed. He dined with the outcast. And, and he preferred the repentant sinner to the haughty and self-righteous religious person. In fact, in the gospel passage we're looking at today, Jesus confronts the religious leaders of his day over just that issue and he uses a parable about two brothers. What is your opinion? He asks. A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go, go out and work in the vineyard today. And he said in reply, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. And then the man came to the other son and gave the same order. And that son in reply said, yes, sir. But he never went. Which of the two did his father's will? And they answered the first, which was, of course, the right answer. But then Jesus takes them by surprise when he says, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. Why? Because they didn't listen to the repentance preached by John. The tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, they listened and they changed. But the religious elites dismissed him and refused to listen. Tax collectors and prostitutes were considered the two worst types of sinners in ancient Israel. By their lifestyles, they had placed themselves outside of God's covenant and in the minds of the religious leaders at the time were not even worthy of consideration. So Jesus telling them that individuals in those two groups who repent will actually enter the kingdom of God before them was both astonishing and offensive. 
Yet another example of the inclusivity of God. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have done. You still belong. At one point, in in another place in the gospel, Jesus compared the kingdom of God to a wedding banquet where all are welcomed. We're going to hear that in two weeks. That'll be the Sunday reading in two weeks. All are welcomed, especially, Jesus says, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Everyone. And the Bible, at the very end, the last book of the Bible, compares heaven to a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. See, God is inclusive. God does not divide and segregate the human race. We do. And when we choose to segregate, divide, classify, cluster, and carve up humanity into separate tribes, groups, ghettos, and enclaves, we are actively working against God's plan of inclusion. So, where do we begin? to heal these divisions, how, how do we get started? Not that I have all the answers. <laughs> Not that I have many answers. But inclusion has to begin, I think, with the belief that the story of every group out there has something to contribute to our common understanding. And I use the term story intentionally because too often the divisions among people are are fostered by arguments over facts. You know, people are always arguing over facts. In today's political controversy, you hear this kind of argument about facts. All white people are racists, declares one group of people. No, we're not, advocates of the counterpoint assert. Justice demands taxing the rich and giving it to the poor, argues one group of people. I'm a member of the 1%. I earned it, comes the reply. Homosexuality can be fixed, some people argue. It's not a choice, others contend. Illegal immigrants are stealing our jobs, some insist. They do the jobs that citizens don't want to and will not do, others respond. And on and on it goes. We argue about facts and it divides us because the cold, hard facts ironically ignite supercharged emotions and promote entrenched positions. Holding on tenaciously to the facts we believe to be true just turns us more and more into fundamentalists people who will not consider new information. In their book, uh, this book I'm reading called Radical Inclusion, it's written by the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Martin Dempsey, and New York Times bestselling author, Professor Ori Braffman, a strange couple to say the least. (laughs) They argue that there will soon come a time when we simply will not be able to tell what is actually true. Facts have become unreliable. News stories are repeated across unregulated social media channels so many times that the the actual facts become distorted. The multitude of posts and reposts introduces instability into our information pipeline. And it creates a a digital echo chamber where people only encounter the information or opinions that reflect and reinforce their own ideas. Despite our best efforts, the authors argue, there will still be times when truth cannot be reliably distinguished from fiction. Now, whatever you think of that argument... It still is true that to practice inclusivity, we have to begin loosening our grip on the facts, relinquishing control over the narrow solutions that our limited narratives, our limited perspectives propose, and start letting the intersecting narratives of our diverse lives guide us. We have to start listening to the stories of others so that we can learn. Facts are debatable and they cause conflict, but stories paint a bigger picture of the truth. Stories bring us together and actually improve our understanding. 
And when we pass along those stories, spreading the ideas and those narratives that resonate deep in our soul, then we are beginning to become inclusive in our outlook and perspective. And then we have to acknowledge the creativity and the genius of the diverse peoples and groups and how our widened perspective can solve the world's problems more effectively than our own limited point of view. A more inclusive society begins with each one of us. So here's a few ways you can begin. First, start consciously assessing your reaction to people who are different from you. Ask yourself whether you value and appreciate their differences and are curious about their unique experiences and want to learn from them. Or consider whether you feel uncomfortable around certain types of people and tend to avoid them. Do you notice yourself making small gestures or subtle comments known as microaggressions that quietly communicate your discomfort? Raise awareness within yourself of how your biases drive your behavior and can negatively impact others without you ever intending it. Notice your reactions to people and ask yourself, why, why am I thinking and feeling this way? Start to invite unconventional ideas and demonstrate appreciation for different perspectives. Take a moment and pause before making decisions that could negatively impact people. And acknowledge and empathize with the feelings and experiences of others, even if you don't agree with them. These are just a few ways you can get started. You know, in the second reading today, St. Paul urges the followers of Jesus to be of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. He says, don't do anything out of selfishness or out of vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, looking out for the other person's interests more than your own. Those words are the perfect recipe for a truly inclusive society. And it all begins in our own backyards. And so I want this parish, my backyard, an extension of your backyard to be an inclusive community. I want to make Jesus matter to everyone, not just to church people or religious people, but also to people who don't like church. Everything we're trying to do here, from the music to, to, to the messages, to the lights, to the environment, is calculated to make outsiders feel like they belong. My dream is to be a church where everyone loves to belong. I want a broad participation by all types of people. I want to reach the unchurched. I want to awaken the faithful to the deeper discipleship. And I want to accompany people on their journey of growth and inspire them to action. Every person, every parishioner, every time, that's my dream. But what's your dream? What's your dream to make your own home? your family, your neighborhood, your workplace, your school, a more inclusive community, a place where everyone loves to belong. And when you can begin to answer that, then we will all enter the kingdom of God together because we will be creating it here on earth. Let us profess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
We remember those who are most in need and raise our voices to God who created all the diverse forms of life. That the church will be a community of faith where all people feel that they belong. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our government leaders will work to create a more inclusive nation that appreciates the differences among people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all people of faith will be united in one heart and mind and focused on the needs of others more than on their own. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That each of us in our daily lives begin to create more inclusive communities where the gifts of each person are valued and supported, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our parish will be a beacon of hope and welcoming place to all who feel excluded from other communities, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the sick and those in distress may know solace in our love, encouragement in Christ, and God's compassion in their troubles, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Dan and Lisa Vito, on their wedding anniversary, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Phyllis Treber, Julieta Ramoso Habuena, Emmanuel Valhelle, Peter Clark, James Mead, and all who have died are now gathered around the throne of God with a great multitude from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God of justice, listen to the prayers of your people. Help us to imitate your generosity as stewards of your abundant gifts and to grow in solidarity with all people in need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one, the one for whom you've loved and gave a son for you.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, O merciful God, that this our offering may find acceptance with you, and that through it the wellspring of all blessing may be laid open before us through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Holy Father, Lord of heaven and earth, through Christ our Lord. For by your word you created the world, and you govern all things in harmony. You gave us the same word made flesh as mediator, and he has spoken your words to us and called us to follow him. He is the way that leads us to you, the truth that sets us free, the life that fills us with gladness. Through your Son, you gather men and women whom you made for the glory of your name into one family, redeemed by the blood of his cross and signed with the seal of the Spirit. Therefore, now and for ages unending, with all the angels, we proclaim your glory. As in joyful celebration, we acclaim. You are indeed holy and to be glorified, O God, who love the human race and who always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son present in our midst when we are gathered by his love. And when as once for the disciples, so now for us he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. Therefore, Father most merciful, we ask that you send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, on the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, gave you thanks, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, Holy Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand, we proclaim the work of your love until you come again, until he comes again, and we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of blessing. Look with favor on the oblation of your church in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us. 
and grant that by the power of the spirit of your love we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son in whose body and blood we have communion. By our partaking of this mystery, Almighty Father, give us life through your Spirit. Grant that we may be conformed to the image of your Son and confirm us in the bond of communion together with Francis, our Pope, Salvatore, our Bishop, with all other bishops, with priests and deacons, and with your entire people. Grant that all the faithful of the Church, looking into the signs of the times by the light of faith, may constantly devote themselves to the service of the gospel. Keep us attentive to the needs of all, that sharing their grief and pain, their joy and hope, we may faithfully bring them the good news of salvation and go forward with them along the way of your kingdom. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face and in the resurrection give them the fullness of life. Grant also to us when our earthly pilgrimage is done that we may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever, there in communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the apostles and martyrs, and with all the saints, we shall praise and exalt you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. In solidarity with all the diverse peoples of the world, we pray in the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. You've been so, so good 
Let us pray. May this heavenly mystery, O Lord, restore us in mind and body, that we may be co-heirs in glory with Christ, to whose suffering we are united whenever we proclaim his death, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at St. Hilary Church for Mass. Again, we're so glad you're here. Hope you got something out of the message today about building an inclusive community in your own life. It begins with you. We are, uh, been, we've have been cleared by Marin County Public Health Authority to begin holding religious services indoors and we are actively making plans to do that. We are putting technology into place so that some people can be in the church and other people can be outside on our plaza. Some people just prefer to be outside right now. They feel it's safer. And so that takes a little bit of technology work to get that going, and we're actively working on that. And uh, we should be get, getting going here in a few weeks. So please bear with us. We'll also be making some plans to bring daily mass, to start having live daily masses here. Um, and just look on our flock note and our website for updates about that. If you're not signed up for our e-newsletter, electronic newsletter, just go to our website at www.sthillary.org. Scroll down a little bit and you can sign up with one click. Maybe it's two, but it's close. <laughs> so it just takes a second and then you'll be up to date with all the things that are happening here. I also want to encourage you, there's still time to join a small group. We've been meeting now for two weeks and we have six small groups just meeting over this message series. They've just been mushrooming. That's, four, that's a 400% increase in our small group attendance. And I hope that you like them so much that you'll be willing to keep going. And the beautiful thing is that we're doing all of these small groups by Zoom. So even if you're tuning in to us this Sunday from different parts of the world or the country, even if you're way out there in Indiana or on the East Coast and you're watching us, you could join one of our small groups. And it's easy, just go to the website again, www.sthillary.org, scroll, scroll down, you'll find a little uh, contact sheet to fill out, you send it to us, we'll get in contact with you and get you into a group. Um, so, it's a wonderful thing to do. It will, it, will, it will help you with your spiritual growth, it will help you to find an inclusive, loving community that will accept and over time come to love you. So I hope you'll give that some real thought. All the other announcements will be in our electronic newsletter. And I hope you have a great week of building inclusive communities in your own backyard. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mass has ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. There is a song I know it well A melody That's never failed On mountains high In valleys low My soul will rest My confidence in you Savior's cross.